the heart, kind of an important organ. Uh, and yet uh, it is an organ that uh, uh, is so important in blood pressure, but also the peripheral um, nerves and the peripheral blood vessels are also important. So let's talk about all of those. Uh, we'll also have talks on lipids and uh, clotting and a bunch of other things that are related. So how can we lower blood pressure? Well, one way is we can use the sympathetic nervous system. We know that the sympathetic nervous system increases the blood pressure. Fight or flight, you want to have a lot of good blood flow to all the critical organs. If we block either the alpha receptors or the beta receptors, we're going to end up lowering the blood pressure, but in very different ways. Beta receptors, um, we're usually blocking the heart uh, and we're slowing the heart rate. That's going to lower the blood pressure. Uh, alpha blockers, we're going to um, block the peripheral nerves and the peripheral blood vessels and dilate them. Um, we can also cause parasympathetic stimulation. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to be very selective for the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. Uh, we're getting better at this, um, but uh, as of right now, we, we're not great. Um, one of the interesting things is that nicotine stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system and actually short term lowers the blood pressure. Uh, obviously long term with all the other damage that cigarettes and nicotine do, uh, it has um, the opposite effect. Now another way to lower the blood pressure is to block the renin angiotensin system. Notice that I say renin and not renin. Uh, for me, renin is a different hormone um, secreted by the stomach, R-E-N-N-I-N. -N -N. Uh, I always pronounce this renin, uh, and most people do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about exactly how that works in a minute. Calcium blockers can uh, block the uh, calcium channels in the heart and in the peripheral blood vessels, uh, although it does have more effect in the heart, it seems. Uh, that'll slow down the heart rate, uh, but it also will decrease the strength of the heart rate. Uh, so especially in somebody with heart failure, you probably want to avoid calcium blockers. Um, there is one that has less um, negative impact on the heart, and that's amlodipine, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Diuretics uh, get rid of fluid in the body, and uh, decreased fluid um, actually decreases your um, uh, stroke volume and decreases your um, blood pressure. There are vasodilators. Alpha blockers are actually one type of vasodilator, but there's some others that work directly on the blood vessels. We don't use these very often anymore because they seem to have a lot more side effects, um, but we will mention them in this talk. So again, how do um, uh, blood pressure medicines work. Um, so if we remember back to the original equation, uh, we know that uh, um, blood pressure equals cardiac output times stroke volume um, times um, systemic vascular resistance. So uh, if we can change any of those things, we'll lower the blood pressure. So uh, diuretics, of course, will get rid of some of the fluid. Um, thiazides uh, get rid of fluid very effectively. Uh, we use them quite a lot. In a minute, we'll talk about the controversy between chlorothalidone and hydrochlorothiazide, but uh, hydrochlorothiazide is actually a very common thiazide diuretic that's used. Um, um, it lowers the blood pressure. Um, it does also uh, help um, with uh, um, some other issues, including um, if someone has high potassium. So if you are trying to have someone who has a low potassium and you really don't want them to pee out as much potassium, you could use a diuretic such as a diazide, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. Um, the other way is to go with an aldosterone blocker or something like spironolactone. Now spironolactone is a very interesting medicine. It does block aldosterone. It also blocks testosterone. Uh, so we do use it uh, for people with PCOS um, or people with um, bad acne sometimes. So um, ACE inhibitors, uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. They all um, work on that renin angiotensin system. 
uh, and end up to cause um, both a little bit of a diuresis and a decrease in the peripheral tone. ARBs are angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, they basically do the same thing, uh, but in a slightly different place in that renin angiotensin cascade. So um, calcium channel blockers. Um, we tend to limit to long acting because the short acting seem to have some negative impacts. Uh, especially we used to take nifedipine, put a hole in it and squeeze it under the tongue if somebody's blood pressure was really high. Uh, this lowered their blood pressure, but unfortunately had a very unacceptable rate of stroke. Uh, so we just don't do that anymore. That's an absolute contraindication to that. Um, we do find that uh, amlodipine does reduce uh, heart attacks and other cardiovascular events. Um, that is the dihydropyridine type calcium channel blocker. The non-dihydros, such as diltiazem and verapamil, seem to have a place in um, clinical care. Uh, people who have atrial fibrillation and we want to control their rate, we often use diltiazem. Um, there is not a great enthusiasm for the use of these uh, non-dihydro uh, calcium blockers for the control of blood pressure, however. You will still see it done. Um, but uh, uh, as noted, they seem to have a lot of side effects and the data as far as actual outcomes on them is not very impressive. Amlodipine is, is you know, the best of the bunch. Uh, and really, you know, when we look at all the data, my opinion is, is that if we're really looking at blood pressure, amlodipine is about the only one that we really want to use. So, um, Again, other things that uh, we can use for um, lowering blood pressure. Alpha blockers work pretty well. The problem with alpha blockers is that they decrease the tone in the periphery. If you decrease the tone in the periphery and someone all of a sudden stands up quickly, you're way more likely to have them have orthostatic hypotension type symptoms. All of a sudden they'll brown out, they'll get dizzy. Um, and so unfortunately, the amount of alpha blockade that we can get is pretty limited. Um, you'll definitely see alpha blockers used for other reasons, however. Um, tamsulosin is a rel relatively selective al alpha blocker that we use for um, um, prostate issues. If somebody has BPH, um, it'll actually relax the sphincter just a little bit uh, and allow them to urinate more effectively. Um, it is still associated with some orthostatic hypotension, um, but since it is more selective to that sphincter, uh, its uh, incidence is substantially lower. Uh, vasodilators, as we mentioned, are still in the mix, but um, rarely used. Um, sometimes they're used in pregnant women. So again, we go back to our equation. Uh, blood pressure is cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance, and cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. I think I misspoke this a little bit earlier. Um, but basically, we can lower the heart rate with a beta blocker, we can lower the heart rate with a calcium blocker, uh, we can um, decrease stroke volume um, by getting rid of some of the fluids with diuretics, um, we can decrease the amount of fluid in the body using ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Um, those also impact the systemic vascular resistance, um, and we can also, in uh, unusual cases, use some vasodilators. So this is just a chart of the angiotensin, renin angiotensin system. You can see where the angiotensin converting enzyme converts the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Uh, interestingly, the um, ACE is found predominantly in the lungs, uh, and because of that, there is a percentage of people, probably 15% or so, um, that when you put them on an ACE inhibitor will um, develop a low-grade cough. Uh, not always to the point where they need to be taken off it, but it's not all that unusual that you need to take somebody off because they don't like the cough. The angiotensin receptor blockers um, work in a different place. Um, they are much, much less likely to cause cough. Um, rarely does that happen. Um, but uh, And aldosterone blockers, of course, we can use something like spironolactone. Um, but uh, you can see there's a number of different places. There is even a renin blocker that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, although it's very, very rarely used.
So this is just basically the same um, slide, except that it talks about the fact that angiotensin II works directly on the uh, periphery to cause vasoconstriction uh, and to stimulate aldosterone secretion. Um, aldosterone's the name, sodium retention is the game. So if you uh, vasoconstrict and you retain sodium, your blood pressure will go up. If we block that effect, your blood pressure will go down. So ACE inhibitors, um, probably the most common one we see used is lisinopril. Um, it works well, it's inexpensive. Um, what does it do? Well, uh, as noted, it decreases that circulating volume by uh, blocking that aldosterone effect. People will not retain sodium. If you don't retain sodium, you don't retain fluid uh, and your blood pressure will go down. So it does decrease the circulating volume. This decreases preload. Um, you know, obviously, the preload and afterload are, are relatively complex concepts. Uh, in my simple family practice brain, uh, preload equates to the amount of fluid in the body, and afterload equates to the amount of uh, uh, arterial tone that you're pushing against. Again, it's slightly more complicated than that, but for most pragmatic pur pur uh, purposes, that's a reasonable way to think about them. So the ACE inhibitors also have a little bit of um, vasodilatory effect. Um, so basically they decrease that peripheral resistance, uh, which will also decrease afterload. Um, this makes them very useful in hypertension. It also makes them very useful in heart failure. Uh, and so uh, they really are one of the mainstays of heart failure treatment. Right now, heart failure treatment is, is usually based on uh, decreasing preload, decreasing afterload, and decreasing um, oxygen needs of the heart. Uh, and basically the way we decrease oxygen needs is we put them on a beta blocker so that it lowers their heart rate so that they have less oxygen needs. Um, so we'll talk more about heart failure when we get to that. Um, it uh, really is those two drugs and then um, maybe some diuretics and especially uh, aldosterone blockers. Um, but we'll talk about that in a later talk. So uh, again, beta blockers, alpha blockers, renin inhibitors, um, whether it be um, uh, directly uh, renin itself or one of the others. Uh, and then there are also these central alpha agonists like clonidine, uh, like methyl dopa, which is aldamet. Uh, they do lower sympathetic tone. Um, because of that, they also seem to be useful for ADD and for narcotic withdrawal, uh, and we do use them for both of these. Uh, again, uh, we'll discuss um, that pharmacology when we get to those areas. ACE and ARBs. Uh, ACEs are usually um, a few more side effects. They're usually a little bit more uh, cough, but they usually are a little bit uh, uh, cheaper. Um, the uh, data foundation, obviously, ACE inhibitors have been around longer than ARBs, uh, so that we do have more studies that really do document their efficacy and effectiveness. Um, but um, ARBs uh, seem to be having pretty much the same effects. I'm not aware of any particular place where uh, there is a sense that you cannot substitute an ARB if uh, an ACE has side effects. So uh, ACE inhibitor uh, side effects, again, um, one of the other things to think about is that if you have somebody who um, is perceiving themselves to have a low blood pressure because they have renal artery stenosis, then that person can sometimes um, end up uh, secreting more renin uh, and ending up with um, uh, basically a clamp down of their kidney uh, and it'll actually decrease their kidney function. So if you put somebody on an ACE inhibitor that has renal artery stenosis, um, they, also, they may actually uh, have their BUN creatinine and their potassium go up. Uh, this is why we are usually very careful to check um, a, at least a BMP uh, within a, a matter of um, four to six weeks after we start somebody on an ACE inhibitor. Um, and we've already talked about the cough. Um, I said 15%, it may be as much as 20%. The ARBs, uh, Losartan um, is kind of the prototype for that, uh, although we have um, uh, 
uh, really kind of gone to longer acting and, and uh, more sophisticated arbs um, with Val Sarton and uh, um, um, Benicar, uh, but um, you know, basically they all work the same. Uh, they have fewer side effects, they might be similar, uh, and they tend to be a bit more expensive. The one renin blocker is Tecturna, uh, also known as uh, the generic name was uh, uh, Um It basically is a very expensive medicine that doesn't work any better than ACEs and ARBs. Uh, back in the old days, people would try to get uh, cumulative effect uh, by using an ACE with an ARB, by using a renin blocker with an ACE. Um, what we've found is that this is a really bad idea, that we end up with a lot more side effects, a lot more problems. Um, so basically there is no scenario in which you will ever use a renin blocker um, and an ACE, or a renin blocker and an ARB, or an ACE and an ARB. You know, one of these medicines is all you need. So um, diuretics, just to go back to diuretics. Um, so most of them, uh, we're going to get rid of sodium. Some of them we get both rid of both sodium and potassium. Um, things like uh, loop diuretics and to a lesser extent thiazide diuretics. Uh, and they all affect um, the absorption or reabsorption of um, electrolytes and fluid in the nephron. So let's look at the nephron. So we can see that carbonic anhydrase inhibitors uh, work uh, way down in that proximal collecting tubule. Um, they tend to be medicines that work um, fairly well as a diuretic, um, but work even better on some other um, parts of the body that also um, use carbonic anhydrase um, to produce fluid. Uh, one of those is the anterior chamber of the eye. Uh, so it is uh, a medicine that if you have somebody that has acute uh, glaucoma, uh, that you can actually lower the pressure in their eye by decreasing the production of um, aqueous humor. Um, they also um, seem to work particularly well for people with um, a certain type of um, brain issue. Um, we used to call this pseudotumor cerebri. Um, you know, we're now calling it uh, uh, um, cerebral hypertension, uh, and there may even be a more sophisticated name at this point, but you should be able to find it uh, uh, looking it up this way. Uh, and it actually will lower that pressure and decrease those symptoms. We see that condition mostly in people that are overweight. Um, they'll have a lot of headaches. Um, but it's definitely something that you want to keep in your mind if you have um, uh, someone who's a bit on the overweight side that um, is constantly having a lot of headaches and the headaches are hard to control. Um, it is not a particularly easy condition to, um, to diagnose. So the loop diuretics, the problem with the loop diuretics is that they have a very short half-life. Um, you'll rarely see family practice use loop diuretics um, you know basically we're trying to use something that's going to have 24-hour coverage the cardiologists will sometimes use them um, especially if they've titrated people in the hospital to a certain level uh, although very frequently they have to be used a couple of times a day uh, loop diuretics are a threshold medicine so basically they either work or they don't based on a certain dose uh, so you're not going to get twice as much effect from 40 milligrams as you would from 20 milligrams. You may get little or no effect from 20 milligrams, and you may have hit the threshold with 40, and then all of a sudden they have good urinary output. Um, uh, sort of an old literary reference. There was a book called House of God that was out in the 1970s that was sort of an irreverent look at a, um, a medical resident, and uh, one of his rules uh, was... Uh, age plus BUN equals Lasix dose. And so that's obviously a, a naive way of thinking about it, but there is some reality to the fact that as people get older, they sometimes do need a little bit higher dose of Lasix to get that threshold. Uh, you will see people sometimes get 160 milligrams of Lasix uh, in a dose. Again, that's not four times as much as 40. You know, it's basically just trying to get to that threshold. Uh, if you give a lot, uh, you can 
drive people out, and you know that causes a certain amount of problems. But as I say, it's usually based on a on a threshold. Uh, thiazides um, will not have quite as much potassium washout, but they definitely still can wash out some potassium. So you do need to keep an eye on potassium levels. Uh, it's not anywhere near as common for someone on a thiazide diuretic to need to go on a potassium supplement. Uh, and again, I think that's one of the reasons that family practice tries to avoid them because it keeps you from having to add a medicine to treat a side effect of another medicine. Potassium sparing diuretics, including um, um, aldosterone blockade, you know, with um, brand name is albactone. Um, most of you are going to think of it as spironolactone, but if I refer to aldactone, it's the same thing as spironolactone. Um, and those basically will, will cause uh, urine output, um, but will not lower the potassium. So if you have somebody who um, has, you know, a, a low potassium, you know, you might want to choose this. Uh, sometimes they'll be used in combination with those loop diuretics um, to try to offset that um, output. Uh, I find that these uh, um, diuretics, especially spironolactone, they work really well for peripheral edema, and I'm not sure why. I don't understand the pharmacology of why they work so much better for peripheral edema than most other treatments, um, but uh, it does seem to be something that I have observed. So the thiazides. Uh, one of the things you're going to see is a lot of references will say use chlorothalidone instead of hydrochlorothiazide. There is some data that would really suggest that chlorothalidone is better. Uh, the problem that I have with that is that uh, the data is, is not absolutely compelling, and in a minute I'll show you an a evidence-based review for that. Um, and the other thing is, is that it's about four or five times the cost of the hydrochlorothiazide, so I'm not sure that it's four or five times better. Um, you do see some cardiologists that will switch all of your patients off their hydrochlorothiazide onto chlorothalidone. Um, but um, you also will see a lot of family practice people continue to use hydrochlorothiazide. So this is the evidence-based uh, medicine consult.com article uh, that really does review this. Um, basically, uh, uh, this pharma uh, pharmacist is saying that uh, we need more studies. Um, that's almost always the conclusion of every evidence-based medicine uh, review. Um, but uh, um, I do agree that we do not have enough to make an absolute um, compelling decision, uh, although you will find people that argue strongly on both sides. Other diuretics, uh, as we've noted, we've already talked about these, and we've already talked about um, why I don't think loop diuretics are used as much in primary care. Calcium channel blockers. Um, there are some theories that especially the... Um, uh, the uh, diltiazem and verapamil type are associated with some adverse effects. Uh, there is some data to uh, suggest that. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I'm actually starting to uh, shift my thinking uh, in evidence-based practice. Um, I just finished reading the Blonde article that I would highly encourage you to read. Um, I'll put a reference to it on the evidence-based practice um, um, talk. Um, but basically, it's saying that real-world evidence is uh, sometimes very different from randomized controlled trials. So um, basically, you know, I think we need to look at more real-world evidence, see whether these calcium channel blockers um, are associated with these outcomes. In the meantime, however, just understanding the pharmacology that they decrease um, the strength of the heartbeat would suggest that they're probably not great medicines for people with any uh, semblance of um, heart failure, uh, and that we probably do have other options that are probably better. So one of the theoretic risks is a risk of heart attack um, in um, people uh, if they are taking the short-acting versions, and as noticed, I uh, rarely take the short-acting. Um, it does mean that you, rather than order Cardizem 30 three or four times a day, that you probably want to do the CD um, you know, at least uh, 120 to 180. Um, uh, there does seem to be an increased risk of, of cancer, although this is obviously a pretty modest increase. Uh, and uh, there is an increased risk of GI hemorrhage. 
uh, although I'm not sure that we've exactly connected this directly to the calcium channel blockers. So some old medicines. So when I was taking pharmacology for the first time back in the 1970s, uh, we learned all these medicines, reserpine, hydralazine, methyl dopa, um, and all of these medicines are still available for treating hypertension. Uh, in general, they're probably not anything that we're going to use unless there's some very unusual situation, such as pregnancy, uh, and then some others that we can use in pregnancy now as well. Um, minoxidil is a medicine that we used uh, years ago for blood pressure, um, but right now it's limited to use uh, mostly for uh, hair growth. It's a topical, um, only about 10 to 20% of people respond to it. Um, but for those people, they can actually get a fairly substantial um, growth of hair. So um, just to review the controversy. So JNC8 is pretty much what I go by. Uh, JNC8 was uh, issued in 2014. It was issued by an expert panel uh, of the Heart Association and the um, American College of Cardiology. Uh, and basically, this is what I usually observe. Uh, in a minute, I'll tell you why I don't observe the 2017 guidelines. Um, and uh, that is controversial because obviously 2017 is more recent. Uh, the problem is, is that a lot of us feel like 2017 were not as evidence-based. So anyhow, so JNC8 basically says use an ACE inhibitor, a calcium blocker, or a thiazide diuretic as a first-line agent. Um, all of those seem to be pretty effective. Um, all of those can usually be done without horrible cost. Uh, amlodipine is really the only calcium blocker I use, uh, and it obviously is a little bit more expensive. So just to um, review again the uh, JNC8 recommendations um, and to recognize. Now, one of the reasons that I don't observe the 2017 guidelines is that the American Academy of Family Practice has not accepted them. And again, the AAFP feels like they are really not as evidence-based. Um, they were issued, at least in, in response, um, to the fact that the 2014 guidelines were not as strict. Uh, the other thing that's happened uh, since then is that a study called the SPRINT study has come out, and the SPRINT study uh, keeps getting cited and tells us, well, the lower the blood pressure, the better. Um, I mean, that statement in and of itself is rather contradictory because obviously your blood pressure can be too low, um, the other thing about the SPRINT study is that the SPRINT study was done only on people that already had known cardiovascular disease. Uh, they had had a heart attack, they had had some sort of a uh, intervention, uh, and so uh, those people did have better outcomes. Uh, will people who have not had that level of heart disease have better outcomes? Maybe. Uh, those who uh, believe in the SPRINT study uh, really do try to emphasize the need to get blood pressure down uh, below 130 over 80, um, and maybe even below 120. Um, a lot of the rest of us are still worried about blood pressure being too low, especially in the elderly, and being associated with falls. So um, just to review a couple of differences between the 2017 guidelines and the 2014 guidelines, the 2017 guidelines say absolutely treat to below 130 over 80 rather than the 140 over 90 that the 2014 guidelines recommends. Uh, it relies pretty heavily on that sprint trial that I was just talking about. Uh, it really doesn't talk a lot about falls or any of the other negative impacts of low blood pressure. Um, and it makes uh, over 100 recommendations. Um, most of which are based on kind of four basic areas. I think that's a lot of recommendations to make based on uh, limited data. Um, and so, you know, as I say, I tend to be a bit, a bit of a, a skinnic. That's a cross between a skeptic and a cynic. So uh, I'm still a JN6, uh, JNC8 guy. Let's just review a little. So JNC8 basically uh, was quiet about anybody that's 18 years old and younger. So uh, pediatric hypertension is a different thing. Uh, 
uh, and uh, you'll need to um, um, investigate that if you do have kids that have high blood pressure. Now, people between 18 and 30, though, it's a bit of a challenge because there's really not a lot of great data on those folks. Um, a lot of those folks, uh, I tend to be a lot more sensitive to the possibility of doing an evaluation for uh, secondary hypertension, you know, looking for a renal artery stenosis or looking for some sort of a uh, um, hormone imbalance, a, a high renin level or uh, high aldosterone levels. Um, Interestingly, the specialist that one usually refers people to for blood pressure issues is a nephrologist. And so because many of the hormones and much of the function that's involved in blood pressure reg regulation is actually in the kidney. Um, so I don't find that if I refer somebody to a cardiologist, they are very good at treating the hypertension. They don't tend to do much of an evaluation looking for secondary hypertension. That's a gross generalization, I know. but. Uh, know your referral uh, options and know what their skills are. So in people between 30 and 59, uh, basically we're going to treat them. Um, in this case, definitely get their diastolic blood pressure below 90. There's good evidence for that. Uh, and uh, definitely in people uh, 60 or older, um, JNC8 says it's fine to let them be uh, as high as 150. You want to keep them below 150. Um, people that are 60 and below, uh, you definitely want to keep them um, uh, lower uh, than that, uh, usually 140 over 90. Uh, people over 80, um, there does seem to be some benefit based on the hypertension of the very elderly trial. Um, again, you need to, in that population, balance the potential risks and the potential benefits. So in people 18 years or older with diabetes, um, usually we're going to uh, initiate an ACE inhibitor. Um, no matter what, you really do want to get a diabetic down below 140 over 90. Um, now that being said, a single blood pressure measurement is not enough for me to change somebody's treatment. Uh, I encourage them to get a blood pressure cuff, take it at home, uh, get me some multiple readings, if I, I get multiple readings and two-thirds of them are above um, 140 over 90, I will alter their treatment, however. Um, this is a uh, grade E recommendation, so it is more based on expert opinion than it is on hard evidence. So this is the all-hat trial um, chart that is really um, the one that is the reason that we do not usually recommend ACE inhibitors first line for African Americans. Now the challenge of course is is that you know not everybody that's African American is you know 100% African American uh, and the other challenge of course is is that many people that are African American are very cynical if you start treating them differently than you start treating people that are of um, um, other uh, heritages. Uh, you know, based on lots of things, but especially based on the Tuskegee study, based on a lot of things, African Americans do not have um, always as much trust in the healthcare system. So in the All Hat study, um, basically they looked at um, a six-year study where they treated people with either chlorothalidone, amlodipine, or lisinopril. Um, and they followed them for six years. And so out of 100 people, so basically this is a percentage. So out of 100 people, what number of those people had particular outcomes? So in the um, people who uh, were on these for coronary heart disease, which are both non-fatal and fatal um, heart disease, uh, 9.6 uh, um, in the chlorothalidone group, 9.5 in the amlodipine group, 10.3 in the lisinopril group. Now, obviously, the lisinopril group is slightly higher, um, but it is not beyond that standard error. You know, obviously, a confidence interval is usually um, two standard errors, and so, um, you know, you're going to see that there's really no difference. All-cause mortality is also no different. Um, that's the number that I tend to look at the most because, yes, I'm interested if you have a heart attack, but I'm more interested in whether or not you die. 
and in this case, there is essentially no difference at all before, between all-cause mortality uh, in um, the chlorothaladone group, the amlodipine group, and the lisinopril group. Uh, basically the same thing for cardiovascular mortality. So did you die of a heart attack? Interestingly, the stroke incidence um, is a bit higher. Um, and it is uh, um, to the point where there is actually some statistical differences. Uh, so the stroke group and the chlorothaladone group, uh, six per hundred per six years, um, and the um, lisinopril group was eight. Now, again, that 2% difference, uh, is that going to be enough to completely change your treatment? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm actually very interested in this renal disease thing because they did suggest that end-stage renal disease was higher uh, in the people that had uh, lisinopril uh, than in the other two groups. Um, I'm interested to see, does this mean that there is more um, renal artery stenosis that we're not catching? I have no idea what the uh, what, e what the etiology or the cause of this would be. So, um, GI bleed was slightly higher with the lisinopril. Uh, not sure why that would be. Um, and and again, so um, I think that the differences are there. I think the differences are relatively modest. If you're going just by all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality, I don't think there's any difference at all. Um, but when you factor in stroke and some of the other issues, um, there may be a reason to choose uh, a diuretic or amlodipine as your first choice rather than an ACE inhibitor. So JNC basically says, you know, uh, if you have somebody, choose a thiazide or a calcium blocker as your first choice. And they, they feel like this is a grade B. Um, people with diabetes, of course, where you're uh, trying to balance the potential renal benefit, uh, renal protect protective benefit of the ACE inhibitors, um, it's a little bit uh, more of a weak recommendation because uh, they feel like you should probably think about doing that. So one of the other big issues is should you titrate a, a medicine uh, to its maximum dose or should you titrate it to a reasonable dose and then add a second medicine? Uh, and basically, there's really um, no absolute uh, answer to this question. Uh, and basically, they say, okay, you, you start a medicine, and before you add a second medicine, you're going to titrate it up. Um, alternatively, you could actually add a second medicine, uh, or if the blood pressure is high enough, you may actually want to go ahead and start with two medicines right off. Um, medication and lifestyle adherence. Uh, lifestyle adherence is a very interesting thing. Um, sodium diets, sodium restriction diets uh, seem to lower blood pressure, um, but not only have not been associated with any improvement in all-cause mortality or cardiovascular mortality, um, there's actually been a couple of studies that suggest it's slightly higher. Uh, no matter what, there's only about a third of people that are uh, salt-sensitive uh, so two-thirds of the people, you can restrict their salt all you want, and it won't affect their blood pressure that much. Um, but there is some people that if you do um, restrict their salt, their blood pressure will come down. So it is something to uh, really think about. Uh, lifestyle, of course, the other thing is try to get to their ideal body weight, try to keep their carbs down, try to have uh, regular exercise. And so basically, this, this is, uh, um, you know, a, a cascade of um, ways to add uh, medicines. Uh, so, for example, in the average white person, I'm going to start lisinopril. Uh, I will go usually to about 20 milligrams. If I'm not at goal, then I usually add a second medicine. Uh, I'll usually add um, a calcium blocker. I'll usually add Norvasc. Uh, at uh, 10 milligrams. I warn them that uh, there is sometimes some peripheral edema associated with it, which is usually not associated with um, heart failure or anything serious. But if they get this peripheral edema, then I have to take them off it and use something else. Um, and then if that isn't effective, usually I'll add a diuretic. Um, usually I'll add hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 to 25. Um, so at any rate, you will need to figure out your own cascade of drugs uh, that you want to use, um, and you'll, you know, 
take my example, take your preceptor's examples, uh, and then you'll figure out eventually what it is that you really want to do. So again, uh, this is that same controversy. You know, do you really um, titrate a drug to the maximum dose? Or do you add a second drug? Um, in fact, uh, drugs at the highest doses may give little improvement in uh, blood pressure control, um, but more side effects. Uh, on the other hand, two drugs is going to be more expensive unless you have a fixed combo like lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide, uh, which often is the same price as a tablet of lisinopril. So, um, you know, the other thing I will tell you is that is that all of these, you know, rules of thumb are just that, that you have to take your knowledge of the evidence and you have to apply it to an individual patient. I can't emphasize enough that evidence-based practice is not just following rules. It's understanding what the evidence is uh, and then applying uh, to an individual patient using your own individual skills. So uh, the next talks, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of these kinds of issues. Mostly you'll learn more about hypertension uh, control once you get to your other clinical courses, um, but this should at least give you a little bit of an intro and a lot of things to think about uh, that you can identify learning issues and look up and, and be trying to understand.